Good day and welcome to the Information Command Center. Here are the studios of the Government Information Service. I'm your host, Tony Nicholas, and we are broadcasting on NTN, as well as the Government of St. Lucia Facebook page and on YouTube. We are also joined by WVNT 93.5 FM. Thank you once again for staying connected with us as we seek to bring you up-to-date and reliable information on the national response to COVID-19, as well as the various sectors within our society. To date, St. Lucia has recorded a total of 18 confirmed cases of COVID-19, and all 18 patients have made a full recovery. There have been two on, sorry, 827 tests for COVID-19, and there are presently 66 persons in isolation and 246 in quarantine. The island remains in a state of emergency until May 31st, with the 10-hour curfew now reduced to 8 from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. daily. The wearing of masks when out in public is advised. We also have an advisory from the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belmar george on the access of care at the respiratory clinics. Do we have that report, Roger? Okay, we'll get back to that report in a moment. And for more information on this, as well as all of the protocols involved in the reopening of the various sectors, you can find the information on the website, www.covid19response.lc. We take a break, and when we get back, we'll be joined by our in-studio guests. It's easy to become afraid during a disease outbreak, especially a pandemic. How can I catch it? Who already has it? How do I stay safe? How can I keep my family safe? Uncertainty can lead us to reject or to be afraid of people affected by COVID-19. It's normal that we feel worried. But sticking with the facts on how to prevent COVID-19 from spreading and what to do if you encounter symptoms is our best defense. Rejecting or fearing people can cause them to hide their symptoms. It discourages people from practicing preventive behaviors like wearing masks and physical distancing. It can even stop people from seeking health care. Ultimately, this means the disease is harder to diagnose, treat, and contain. So how can we overcome fear and stigma to help the fight against COVID-19? Words matter. Talk to and about people affected by the virus with respect. Spread the facts. Practice and share the recommendations endorsed by your health authorities. Be kind and look after each other. Check in on your family, friends, and neighbors. Offer support where you can. Have you seen social stigma happening in your community? How did you respond? Tell us in the comments below. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. And I believe that we now have that report from the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belmar George. On Wednesday, May 21st, 2020, the World Health Organization reported a total of 4,731,458 confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, with 316,169 deaths. Within the region of the Americas, a total of 2,082,945 confirmed cases were recorded. To date, this is a significant marker in the global response to COVID-19. As the World Health Organization notes, this is the largest single-day increase of cases globally. This highlights the continued threat to human health and the level of vigilance which is required in the public health response to COVID-19. St. Lucia continues to record no additional confirmed cases of COVID-19. 
On May 21st, 2020, a batch of 40 tests conducted were all negative. This brings our total of national testing to date to 867 tests. Thursday, March 21st, is the 18th consecutive day since we have recorded a confirmed case of COVID-19. This is quite encouraging results for us at the Ministry of Health and certainly for the entire country. However, we should not allow this trend to cause us to become complacent. The reduced numbers in testing for this week is attributed to the reduced number of persons accessing care at the respiratory clinics. We also note a reduced number of persons with respiratory signs and symptoms. We would like to remind the public that the respiratory clinics remain open. The access of care at our respiratory clinics by persons who experience flu-like symptoms was one of the key means through which we were able to promptly identify persons who fit the case definition of COVID-19, test, isolate, and some were confirmed for COVID-19. These persons were also put into care in a timely manner. We encourage every individual who is experiencing flu-like symptoms to access these respiratory clinics. The service is free to the user and all COVID-19 related care is free of charge to the individual. The Ministry of Health and Wellness, we once again ask the public to work with us to reduce the impact of COVID-19. Remain proactive and on high alert. By doing so, we do not only protect our health, but that of every citizen. And by doing so, we can keep our entire nation safe. Every individual, can make us push further along in overcoming COVID-19. Our request remains simple. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water or use hand sanitizer when hand washing is not possible. Cover your cough and sneeze, adhere to the six foot physical distancing guideline and wear your homemade mask when going out. The Ministry of Health and Wellness, we will continue providing you with regular updates on COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Sharon Belmar George, for that update and a timely reminder that we continue to obey the various protocols. Today at the Information Command Center, we'll be discussing biodiversity ahead of the International Day for Biological Diversity. The United Nations have proclaimed May 22nd the International Day for Biological Diversity to increase understanding and awareness of biodiversity issues. The theme this year is Our Solutions Are in Nature, and our in-studio panel will discuss ecosystems and the benefits persons get from the function of such, our fight against global warming and biodiversity loss, among other things. Our panelist today is Feria Nassis, Research Officer, Forestry Division, the Ministry of Agriculture, Janelle Gabriel, Sustainable Development and Environment Officer, Department of Sustainable Development, and Ms. Yvonne Edwin, Information and Communications Officer of the Fisheries Division. Good afternoon to you ladies. Good afternoon. And I'm wondering why we have three ladies only discussing biodiversity, but in the wing somewhere we have Mr. Thaddeus Constantine as backup. He's the Officer in Charge of Marketing Unit, Ministry of Agriculture. So today we're discussing biodiversity and nature, of course, in the midst of the global health pandemic, the coronavirus. Before we could even begin to put it all into context, let's first break down biodiversity. What is biodiversity? Okay. Um, thank you for having us and happy International Day on Biodiversity to you. Um, biodiversity is made up of two words, bio, which means life or living things, and diversity, which means variety, uh, different kinds. So biodiversity really simply means different kinds of living things, having a variety of different types of living things, different types of plants and animals and microorganisms. Um, we are familiar with biodiversity. We take it for granted. We know we have bougainvillea and we have green and red and yellow and orange and white and purple 
Um, we, we know we have mangoes and we have mango long and tin quem and julie and all of those different kinds of living things um, which are different and allow us to be resilient because we have um, all of this variety available to us. So when we talk about biodiversity it's, and, and its conservation, we are really talking about how can we continue to exist and continue to be resilient um, having these different types of plants and animals and microorganisms at our disposal. Um, and, you know, Ose Nusha has been a party to the Convention on Biological Diversity from 1992, when the convention was first signed on to by the countries around the world. Um, these countries realized that we needed biodiversity for everything that we do, for our food, for our water, for our agriculture, tourism, and all these different areas where we uh, are able to generate industry and livelihoods. So they decided to conserve biodiversity for, um, for economies and for social purposes, for communities and so on. Um, and so for these 27 years, we've been, as conservationists and natural resource managers, we've been champion, championing the cause of protecting nature, safeguarding our nature. This year, under this theme of our solutions are in nature, we get to flip that a little bit and look at what solutions can we get from our biodiversity? What can we get from nature, especially now as we are gripped by this pandemic? What can we look to nature to help us, us address? What solutions can we find out in our forests, out in our rivers, our, our coral reefs, and all of these other ecosystems that we have available to us? Mm. And interestingly, too, at this time, a number of persons are reflecting, as you rightly said, about nature, you know, our ability to feed ourselves, agriculture, Absolutely. the forest, using herbs as healing and, you know, just mm -hmm. being closer to nature. Absolutely. You know, do you think that's something that's going to continue beyond this or just a moment, a passing moment? Or are you hoping that this thoughtfulness or regard for nature continues? Well, for years, I think we've seen that the, the benefit of being able to feed ourselves, for one, uh, for the benefit of knowing what we have in our forests and how they can be used for medicines, for cosmetics, for, for small businesses, and, and all of those different sorts of things. Somebody said um, being able to grow your own food is like being able to print your own money. So I, I'm hoping that after this, we will still have that passion for for growing our own food, for being resilient, for being able to control what we eat and what we put into our bodies, and of course, being able to maximize on all of the plants that are out there, some that we know about already, some that we're still trying to find out, or we haven't passed down the traditional knowledge from our grandparents. We know they can do something, but we're not quite sure. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that this will continue after we are out of this uh, crisis period and people will start to maximize on the potential and all the ecosystem services that our ecosystems provide. Mm. We have two very important sectors here, <laughs> agriculture and fisheries. Um, quite a lot of fish these days in our oceans, in our waters, but let's take a look at agriculture first of all. Um, what is the importance of agriculture in the whole mix? So that's a question for mm -hmm. Tadius, who will come in later. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to touch down on forestry and the uh, many benefits that um, are provided by the forest. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the ecosystem services, we want to touch down, for instance, on the goods. And like you said earlier, indicated earlier, we have all those um, traditional medicines, the herbal plants that have been used and are continued to be used by persons. We have um, other non-timber products as well, you find persons make um, the, the wine out of the latanye palm, as well as the broom. You have basket making and so on. There's also ecological functions such as um, storing of carbon, you have nutrient cycling, and also you have um, purification of our air and water. Social benefits as well, social and cultural benefits. Persons use the resource you find for recreation and for other traditional traditional use, uses. But the challenge for us is finding ways to continue to use these um, ecological services without compromising the ability of the forest to do so. And I also want to touch down on the importance of conserving the forest for our water quality and quantity. So the forest plays a role, the trees play a role in, in, in retaining moisture. And even the foliage would actually trap water and prevent rapid runoff and it, it increases the water table and also when you look at um, 
soil erosion as well. The trees play an important role in reducing um, um, sediment loss. And some persons, I'm sure they would recall, we had a mango biodiversity project, which was sponsored by the OCS um, through the Global Climate Change Alliance, where we planted 6,000 mango plants along um, a few rivers um, across the island. And we are, we are beginning to see positive impact coming out of that. You find the mango has a deep-rooted system, and it actually keeps the soil in place and prevents erosion. So these are some of the things that we really want to share with the public in terms of using it for goods and likewise other services. Quite apart from individuals protecting and the con whole conservation of the forest and what have you, is there anything in place in terms of the protection from outside forces, in terms of our biodiversity, our herbs and what have you? Is there any sort of legislation in place where that is concerned specifically? Well, one of the most recent things that we have done is to um, develop a national biodiversity strategy and action plan. And that looks at a suite of, of both policy and on the ground and financing solutions to, in, to allow us to be able to conserve biodiversity. Uh, we also have legislation which protects specific areas such as our forests, which are key for, as watersheds to uh, contain water um, and also to, to um, trap carbon. So here around the world, people are talking about global warming and uh, carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere in these large amounts that are heating up the planet. But here our forests are a solution to that where trees simply store up all that carbon and allow us to have um, a cooler climate. Um, so there are things that are in place for protecting forests and other ecosystems, marine reserves and so on. And there is that National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan which is approved by the government of St. Lucia in 2020 this year so that we have a strategic approach to seeing what ecosystems are, are available to us and seeing how we can maximize them and protect them for future generations. Okay, sounds good. From the land, let's move for a moment into the sea. Fisheries. Tell us what's happening with fisheries at this moment. But as you know, the world relies on the ocean for food, for transportation, and for energy. Um, but one of the things that has been affecting the ocean in terms of climate change, this is a factor that when we bring it into focus with everything that is happening, it puts additional pressure on a resource that we depend on so much. As you know, a lot of our communities are along the coast and are very dependent on the ocean. You have a lot of persons relying on the ocean for their livelihoods, things like sea moss production, um, a lot of small-scale fishers going out to sea. Of course, these are important livelihoods that bring in economic activity. Again, very important. Um, as a department, we ensure that we protect um, our marine resources. Um, we heard mention of marine reserves, marine protected areas. All of these are in place to ensure that future generations can enjoy what the ocean provides for us. Mm -hmm. Again, Mother Nature, um, when we look at things on, on, on the surface, Mother Nature has put all these things in place so that we could survive um, from, the, from the, the natural environment around us. And the ocean is no different. Again, uh, a lot of dependence on the ocean, but there is a lot of life below water. Mm -hmm. So our coral reefs, our mangroves, our beaches, all of these are ecosystems that are important and it, 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 it provides the habitat for all of this biodiversity that we speak of. Mm -hmm. So the plants and the animals in there all need to be protected and we need to use it in such a way that we could feed our nation. We could provide that food security that we've been speaking about. I think COVID has really tested our resilience as a nation. It has reinforced the message that we should reduce our import bill and become more self-sufficient. Again, our ocean provides that, the forest provides that, but when we look at everything in, in the scheme of things, it is very important that we protect and conserve. And we've been saying these messages going out into schools and speaking about this, but I think COVID has really forced us mm -hmm. and for persons to actually see this mm -hmm. as important. In terms of the messages, um, do you think they've been more and more effective over the years, especially when it comes to when you announce things like the, your lobster season and what have you, do you think the message is now reaching more and more persons and they're responding to those messages? I think the message is reaching persons because you would imagine in, in everywhere you go, somebody would you know, remind you 
is the lobster season open? Is the turtle season open? And this is far and wide in a gas station for sometimes in a supermarket. You're on the beach and you would have that conversation with persons. So you do know that the message is reaching persons. And this is really in place because we have a very strong coalition of environmental officers who go out into the schools. And we do this as, as a collaboration, as a... Uh, an environmental team bringing that message across because everything that happens on land mm -hmm. it somehow boils down and it affects the ocean and everything in between that so from the ridge mm -hmm. to the reef this is very key and important and mm -hmm. all sectors all the stakeholders on the table here today we all have a, a stake in this mm -hmm. to protect and to conserve mm -hmm. so the message is reaching the public okay general with the onset of COVID-19 how is that going to impact your ability to deliver on your messages, especially not just for um, World Biodiversity Day, but moving forward? It's, it's, um, it's an, an interesting question because I think right now Mother Nature is reminding us of, of some of the messages and packaging it in a way that people can respond to. So maybe um, we were saying, you know, don't cut down these trees and, and don't cut down, you know, this, this mangrove or this little swamp over here and, and people couldn't relate to that message. But when it translates into um, there's no honey or one bottle of honey is a hundred dollars for one because there is a scarcity because there are no trees uh, and there's no flowering trees for bees now people start to get the message so I think with this pandemic that we are experiencing right now uh, we will start to make the connections between what is happening in the environment and our abilities to feed ourselves which is a very very basic thing um, that most people can relate to and also the impact that it is having on our pockets mm -hmm. um, we, we asked about agriculture a little earlier there is no agriculture without biodiversity uh, farmers need the bees they need the insects they need worms to dig through the soil and aerate um, they need trees to hold the water in the soil and allow mm -hmm. the, the crops to grow uh, there was a, a study that said that if we didn't have bees farmers would be spending billions of dollars every year pollinating by hand so when we we have these circumstances these crises or these opportunities if you want to look at it in that way like covid um, we really start to see the value of these resources and the messages come down to us in terms of what we need to do so that we can have them going forward. Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe Ferry, you could also shed some light. We are yes. now faced with a severe drought. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could like shed some light as far as the forestry, like biodiversity, yes. the watershed yes. areas and what have you. Yes. So I agree with um, 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 what Janet, Janet just said. Um, in light of COVID, everybody would like to wash their hands on a regular basis, and now we're going through a water crisis. So because of the fact that we, we're going through such a, a situation, people understand the need to conserve water. They understand the importance of forests um, um, to increase the water quantity. So we are starting to see people taking those measures to, 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 to save water and also to do what they have to do in terms, for instance, you find in the past we would deal with the schools and we'd go in there and we'd deliver the lectures to students and stuff. We'd put up little signs, you know, keep the tap closed, don't, you know, let the water run and stuff like that. Yes, they would do it, but I think now because of COVID, I think that when we go back to the schools, we'd, you know, start to see the young children actually keeping the tap closed and taking those necessary measures. And even at home as well, mm -hmm. people are going to start, you know, doing these little things, you know, to, to, to conserve water. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so, um, Janelle had um, um, earlier um, spoke about the forest reserve, the first forest reserve. She wanted us to shed some light on that. That became a protected forest um, somewhere in the 1916s. And for two, two main reasons, two main functions was to protect the plants and animals and also to harness water to the city of Castries. But ever since the construction of the Roseau Dam, you find that we don't use the Castries Water Works Reserve to, you know, supply water to the city. And it, as a department, we are continuing to mo monitor the forest. Um, we ensure that there are no illegal pra um, practices going on there. People are abiding by the laws. Um, they're not going into the reserve without permission. So we are constantly on the ground monitoring the situation. Likewise, the Water Resource Management Agency. Mm. I noted that among the activities planned to raise awareness of the value of our abundant biodiversity would include a 
Facebook challenge. Tell us okay. a little more about that. Okay. Um, well, one of the things we really wanted to know um, right now is what are people seeing? What plants and animals are people seeing? Are you seeing more of some, some birds in your backyard? Are you hearing some different animals um, as opposed to before? So now that people are at home and they have that opportunity, we have the Facebook challenge with the hashtag biodiversity in my backyard. So people are free to send in pictures from their backyards. A lot of people are busy right now with their backyard gardening and as therapy and as well as a, a source of, of food. So we want pictures of their backyards, your gardens, your um, whatever biodiversity you see, sent to our Facebook page, uh, Sustaining St. Lucia 411, uh, with the hashtag of biodiversity in my backyard or hashtag SLU Biodiversity 2020. Because the theme is our solutions are in nature, the other Facebook challenge is what is your solution? So we're throwing it out there. Uh, what solutions can you find f out of nature? Last year, the theme was biodiversity and health. So we got quite a few suggestions on health remedies, what, what you can do for belly aches, what you can do for insomnia, um, to prevent mosquitoes, and lots of great solutions. This year, we want to focus on health, on business, on, on the um, cosmetic side of things, industry, technology that persons are using, um, that nature is being mimicked around the world because it is the ideal, it's the template, the model. So there are lots of cases where we can mimic what nature does to, to make things better and easier for us in the way we construct our roads, treat our waste, um, manage our waste waters and so on. Uh, so this second um, challenge is what is your solution, where we ask people to send in a solution s using biodiversity and all of these will be judged. This competition will go on from May 22nd until the 22nd of June. And then at the end of June, we will announce the winners and they will get some nice vouchers and prices, compliments our partners, Massey, OECS, and the government of St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. With our children now at home, learning from home, yes. are there any activities targeted specifically at them? Yes, well, we will all be um, doing virtual biodiversity school. And again, that will be up on our Facebook page, Sustaining St. Lucia 411. And th there will be a, a series of um, short videos for different age groups. So we will take from the little ones all the way up to the um, community college level breaking down what is biodiversity, why do we need it, what can you do to conserve it, because really uh, we want people to get involved and see this as something that is beneficial to them. And we really want them to understand the value of the biodiversity that we have in our country. So it, it's a, a huge challenge um, for people to conserve if they don't think this, this resource is valuable. Um, mm -hmm. So to really bring down the message of why it's valuable, what, what it is that we have, why it is so special, and communicate that to different age groups and all of that material will be available and circulated through our various partners on our YouTube site and on our Facebook page. Okay, so teachers and parents could look forward to a short break if you guys That's stepping right. in and providing that information. And, and they can right? actually yes. reach out to us and we will host maybe a Zoom class with them if they want or a Google session, but we will have the material available and if they want they can also call us and or reach out to us on Facebook and we can make an arrangement mm -hmm. to, to be present, either one of us or any of the other folks on our environmental coalition. Sounds interesting. Yes. Yvonne, in terms of fisheries and fishermen, do you find that, again, going back to the message and getting the message across, that in terms of best practices and the understanding that it cannot just be business as usual, that you go out there and it's an infinite resource that you go and just fish out. Do you think that now there's an understanding of how to do things and to do it properly, properly sorry, so that you protect the environment? I mean, we continue to ensure that persons are adhering to the regulations that are in place. I mean, you do that when there is a season, you have various management measures. In some countries, you would have quotas, the closed seasons is what persons would be more familiar with. I think COVID has just reinforced again those messages that we have said, um, press releases or public service announcements that we have made. So it's not that persons are not aware, they are. Um, we do have our extension officers who do inspections and do one-on-one -on -one and extension work uh, uh, with the fishers and they are out there in the communities. But this is just teaching us and reinforcing this lesson. Mm -hmm. You mentioned just a short while ago in terms of persons who send in like their formulas, the different home remedies. Is there anything in place in terms of protecting the intellectual property and patents and what have you mm. when it comes to those herbs and the remedies and what they can be used for? 
Okay, um, that's a great question, and uh, one of the uh, sub protocols attached to the convention to protect biodiversity is the Nagoya protocol on access and benefit sharing and you may have been hearing a lot about it uh, last year because St. Lucia was getting ready to sign on to that convention so basically it says that if there is a genetic resource a plant an animal um, that is used in for some reason if it can be for a drug or, or for medicine or something that the the benefits have to be shared equally among all persons so if St. Uh, St. Lucia has a, a bee species or a snake species that has a useful property and that is used, that genetic resource is used, there's a system in place where the community where it is found can benefit or the, the, the country as a whole can benefit mm -hmm. uh, and that is under the Nagoya Protocol. In, in a way it helps us to conserve because if I see um, a resource as mine, I will not want to destroy it and if I see it's going to benefit me and future generations, then again it's, um, I won't, I I will, I will want to have it around. So mm. it's it's a protection of the intellectual property as well as the species itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. In terms of the mangroves, who does that fall under? Fisheries or forestry? <laughs> well, <laughs> kind of I would say That's both. I would say both. <laughs> um, but as it relates to mangroves, um, persons sometimes do not understand the value. So they would, you know, it's an old mung, mm -hmm. it's an old yes. mushy area, mm -hmm. and so they Breeding would not, they would not place much value on it. But mm -hmm. Mangroves are extremely important. They serve as a filter, so everything coming from the land, they would filter that and it, so it doesn't enter into the ocean. So garbage, um, waste management, um, you know that is an issue in St. Lucia and, and, and across the, the globe, but the mangroves serve as this filter. It traps and it's also a habitat for juvenile fish. This is where they would grow, they would spawn before they go out into the ocean, before mm -hmm. our fishermen can catch them and for us to have it on our plate. Mm -hmm. So ecosystems are important. Again, um, the, the plants and animals in there, they all depend on each other. So to take away this habitat, you mm -hmm. are in fact affecting biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And when we continue to throw out our waste pollution, um, these issues affect biodiversity in one way or another. Mm -hmm. So it's a very important ecosystem, the mangroves, because it serves as this filter um, and so it does not affect the coral reefs. So I think very, this, very important. I think we saw the functions of, of mangroves when we had uh, one of our latest storms and the, along the, um, the east coast where mangroves had been removed, the, the plantations the got, there was incredible flooding and plantations got damaged, banana trees were um, wiped, all, wiped away because you didn't have those mangrove ecosystems trapping the water, controlling the sea level and so on. So even while we don't know the, the role that some of these ecosystems play, they do have a value and, and that value is something that we must understand and appreciate so that we can really go out there and encourage people to, to protect them. Okay, interesting that you brought that up. We do for a break, but probably when we come back, we could look at, we're heading into the hurricane season mm -hmm. and in terms of what persons could do to ensure that you know, we maintain a certain level of protection with our biodiversity. We take a break now and we come back, we continue the conversation. COVID-19 is a new pandemic disease as declared by the World Health Organization. It is transmitted directly by respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs or sneezes or indirectly through rubbing the face with contaminated hands. There is still no specific treatment of vaccine against COVID-19 and as such, the farming community should adhere to some special recommendations. Ensure that farm clothing and gear is clean. Wash hands thoroughly before harvesting crops. Use face masks and head ties whilst harvesting, cleaning and packaging crops. Use all safety precautions when transporting crops to the markets and depots, such as handling crates and crops with only clean hands and covering sneezes and coughs with a tissue or the inner arm to ensure body fluids or droplets don't get on produce and washing hands or using hand sanitizer after using the tissue. More than ever before, your important role as gatekeepers of St. Lucia's nutritional health and food security should be taken seriously. When you exercise these precautions, you not only safeguard your health, but also continue to allow all St. Lucians access to freshly grown fruits, vegetables, and other local crops. Remember, it is our responsibility to ensure our nation eats fresh, St. Lucia's best.
and welcome back. Today we're discussing biodiversity and joining us on the panel today is Thaddeus Constantine, Officer in Charge, Marketing Unit, Ministry of Agriculture. Okay, thank, you for having me. thank you for having me. Because of COVID-19, the spotlight has been thrown on agriculture from day one. Persons you never heard talking about agriculture now talking about agriculture, growing their own food, and the ability of you know, our, our farmers to sustain us and to provide for us. What is your take on that? Well, agriculture is a very important part of our economy. Um, though the contributions to GDP of agriculture are not um, as clear as they should be, because the contribution is even larger than we, what we calculate, um, we need to look at agriculture as a mainstay within our economy. It's one of the pillars of our economy. Um, if we can feed ourselves, it means we can take care of ourselves. Agriculture goes beyond just food, where we look at um, providing of shelter, because through agriculture and forestry, like Fer Ms. Ferrer just said, um, we can provide shelter for ourselves, right. we can provide clothing for ourselves, and so there's a lot agriculture can do, just beyond just the food. Um, because of the, the thrust into biological farming a few years ago, we realized that St. Lucia is one of the islands that is blessed with uh, great diversity of beneficial organisms. Most of those that we cannot see, strangely mm -hmm. enough, 90% of the work that our farmers do, they cannot see it. Mm -hmm. um, but these are the ones that have the most value. Um, they have the most value when you look at it on a research level, the lab level, where we can produce these beneficial microbes and pattern them into pesticides and fertilizers and also to protect the livelihoods and ensure that we have these um, resources available all the time. So for example, if pesticides do not come on the island, our microbes can do the job and can keep our crops safe and ensure that we're able to eat. Mm -hmm. In some circles, you mentioned pesticides, but very often pesticides could be a bad word, mm -hmm. depending on where you get it from, what it contains, what have you. How do we ensure that we get the right pesticides into the island? Okay, so we have a, a pesticide controls board, um, a, a chemicals control board, and they, do, they take care of the pesticides along other th among other things. Um, they ensure that we do not allow banned pesticides, and the pesticides that come in are all registered. Um, we have the quarantine department that helps with the enforcement of that. But um, beyond the chemical pesticides, our environment has a way of healing itself. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, you will go into wild places and you will see beneficial mites coming back in. Mm -hmm. um, organisms that would be decimated by the use of our agrochemicals. Um, but these would eventually show up by themselves. And so in many of our abandoned farms, we have seen a lot of good things happening. And though they were abandoned, but they now are a hotspot for that biodiversity because these pests that originally were on our crops are still there. However, the pesticides that were used to kill the, the, the pest are no longer being used in, this, in, in these areas. And since they're no longer being used now, we have our natural controls coming back and this is an area we need to focus on. We always say that we are small, we have no resources, but if we start looking at our microbes, we realize that Nusha can be a real powerhouse on the global scene. Mm -hmm. We need to protect what's ours, but also we need to know what's ours. Mm -hmm. um, so where do we start? How do we start? We start with research. Okay. We start with good, well thought out, well planned research. Mm -hmm. And um, we have the personnel to do it. We have the will, mm -hmm. yes, we need to execute. Mm -hmm. We generally need to execute. But that's where it starts. It starts mm -hmm. with good research, good sound research. And with that, we can see that the island would be able to generate incomes from places that at present we don't imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can be done to ensure that the whole conversation about backyard garden and home garden, that it's not just going to be a fad, that beyond COVID, COVID. we could see a resurgence of that? I'm hoping that um, COVID has woken us up because your backyard is actually supposed to be a sanctuary and out of your sanctuary you're supposed to be able to eat, mm -hmm. eat and know mm -hmm. what you're producing. So you know what you put in there, you know what's coming out. Um, too many times our householders go to the markets and they buy food that is tainted with 
agrochemicals, with biological contaminants, and they're not aware. And so we have lots of problems within our healthcare system. We have high levels of diabetes, hypertension, and all of these can be solved by improving our diets. Mm -hmm. So put a few cucumbers in your backyard, they're not very difficult to grow. Put a few pumpkins, put the, the cabbages, feed them with compost. If you don't know how to do compost, there's a million videos on YouTube where you could go and learn that, but you could also approach us at the ministry. And we have a, a wide variety of pamphlets that we've prepared over the years. A lot of them sit in our library that we are willing to share. So we have the knowledge base, and that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. It truly is the way to go. I see Janelle nodding. I guess you're going to tell us what your backyard garden entails. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, well, uh, throughout this process, while we've all been at home, you know, you have your little scraps, you have your little pumpkin seeds and so on. And so I, I found I've had, I have a little bit of a green thumb and I've been experimenting with, with a few things in, in the garden, pumpkins and so on. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to say was we mentioned that um, we are mimicking nature all the time. And some of the, the, um, the really synthetic uh, pesticides that we are using came from natural elements that were synthesized to create that effect. Mm -hmm. So um, there, there are options. Over the last few years, we've been exploring organic production, um, organic farming, and, and there are ways that we can use what we have naturally to increase the nutrient content of our soils, to control the pests without having these negative impacts on our bodies or our, eco uh, our ecosystems. Uh, we also have been working on this re decade of research and innovation and have met some people doing fantastic work, some young people at the secondary school level, um, down in Sufre and, and around the country in Miku and Denry and so on, who are doing research, going out in the field, collecting their observations and using and using that material to come up with ideas and solutions. So here I just wanted to say that research is not something that is only done in a lab or with somebody with a coat or you know their, their lab coat and so on. But our farmers are researchers, our housewives are researchers, students can be researchers and we start small, we look at what we have because we know what we have better than anybody else or any external person that can come in. Our grandparents, our, our older folks know the value of these things. Mm -hmm. And so that is one place where we start, where we start the research, cat cataloging what we have, finding out how it has been used, and then exploring from that on a more scientific level. Mm -hmm. Talking about solutions, um, with regard to marine solutions, Yvonne, what are some of the areas currently being explored? The marine solutions that are being explored, I would say, I mean, I mean there are just so many things that you're seeing either coming back or you've seen too much of. So sargassum, for example, last year, within last year, you had an influx of sargassum. This in some areas have decreased and you're seeing it in new areas now. So you had a lot of sargassum on the west, on the east coast, but now you're seeing some resurgence of it on the west coast. And not in the, the numbers, and you're seeing persons using that um, in, in, in various ways to make um, pesticides. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and so you, you, there are uses that comes naturally, and, and this is something that was natural. And mm -hmm. it was just a matter of us finding innovative ways. And again, going back to the research. Um, what I wanted to add as well is that a lot of plants and animals, so persons are saying they're hearing birds, um, fishers may be telling you they're seeing species that they had not seen for quite some time. We I saw that with the flying fish, fish last week. Catch, yeah. mm -hmm. And so Mother Nature has gotten an opportunity for it to rejuvenate, to replenish itself, and gotten a, a chance to, to relax. Even now, during this period, March to November, it's our um, nesting turtles. Sea turtles would come up to nest. Um, they would come along the beaches, uh, along the beaches um, on the coastline. And so the fact that there are not a lot of people on the beach, it gives them the opportunity to freely come up and lay. Mm -hmm. So again, the solutions are there. And I think this time, it, it's, it's just really an opportunity where we have gotten to see things coming back. Mm -hmm. And we saw that with flying fish, and I'm sure when we go out and we're able to go out in the field, persons would tell us of baby species that they had not seen in quite some time. Mm -hmm. In the mix of a conversation with biodiversity comes reusable energy. Have we begun to look at um, using the wave as a resource to generate energy? I think these are all areas to explore. Um, this could come um, down the line in, in terms of our plans. It is something across the globe you're hearing about renewable, renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So it is something to explore. It is just a matter of tapping in 
to the natural resources that we have. Mm -hmm. Talias? Um, free energy is one of the areas um, this island can do very well with. When you say um, free energy, yeah. explain. Um, I mean energy free from, away from the fossil fuels, energy okay. that you don't have to pay for. Okay. Right. So you could generate it right there on your farm. Mm -hmm. You could generate it at your home. Um, it's all around us. Electricity is all around us. We are actually electrical beings. Mm -hmm. And um, we've gotten, we've, we're, we're children of habit. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten some bad habits over the years. Mm -hmm. And one of them is our fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when we look at manufacturing in St. Lucia, um, we, have, we, we are at a comparative disadvantage. But it's only because of the power. And so if we fix our laws, first of all, and also educate our people on how we can harness energy and how we can use it more efficiently, it would definitely change our, our um, economic landscape overnight. It would change dramatically just by changing the way that we interact with energy and the way that we use energy. Also, it would also protect our biodiversity because mm -hmm. it means at this point, we'll be putting less contaminants into the system. Mm -hmm. And so energy is one of the areas we need to have a, a national consultation. We need to have that big national conversation. Mm -hmm. And we need to have that national moving away from the things that have been hurting our economy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of them is this fossil fuel. But persons might say we keep having those conversations. How do we move from conversation to action? Yeah. <laughs> well, that comes with will. Desire. <laughs> All you have to do is desire to do it, and mm -hmm. it will happen. Mm -hmm. um, but knowledge is power. So yeah. if I didn't know that I could produce energy out of wave action, then I wouldn't be able to. Mm -hmm. But if I know, and then I can eventually get to the point where I can see I can use the... The, the materials around me, and I don't have to import anything fancy, mm -hmm. and I don't have to import any fancy expert, but I can use the, the knowledge that is within my society to get these solutions, then the solutions can be had. Mm -hmm. Forgive me for keep coming back to that point, but it's okay. something that fascinates me. We, okay. We're talking about food and agriculture, what have you, but we have a wide variety of herbs. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, you know, your grandmother, your mother mm -hmm. knows what is necessary for what. Mm -hmm. But we have not found a way to package that this and to sell it and to, for it to become part of our economy. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, that boils down to um, <laughs> research. At this, we've come, we've come under, uh, to a juncture in our growth as a species where we need things to be tested and proven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, our grandparents didn't need that. Mm -hmm. Our grandparents um, were more faith-based, mm -hmm. and so if it worked for the neighbor, it would work Oops. for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've come to a point where we need to see it um, proven by 50 doctors, and it has to be peer-reviewed, and it has to be... Mm -hmm. So, um, as, an, as a nation, we need to be aware of what we have, and also now look at how we can use that information to channel um, growth in our economy. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that we need to move away from the things that we're presently doing, but we need to expand. Mm -hmm. We need to expand the horizons. So um, we have a few gifted entrepreneurs. We have, for example, the young man who's making vodka out of dash, um, dashin and breadfruits. Mm -hmm. And we need more people like that, more innovators like that, um, to come in and, and to make use of, of these resources. So like, for example, what Dr. Centros is doing, Mm -hmm. She's now taken a whole line of our local herbs and, and packaged them and gotten the testing done. And we need, we need more of our, our local entrepreneurs to move in that direction where we can get the, that knowledge, that traditional knowledge, peer-reviewed mm -hmm. and tested and then packaged and, and mm -hmm. sold. And I guess for mm -hmm. Yvonne, go ahead, go ahead. No, I we just wanted to add that sometimes we have to see something proven. And, and mm -hmm. we, we, again, we, we sort of a creature of habit. Um, until it's not FDA approved. Things like right. coconut oil. Mm -hmm. I mean, our forefathers, our parents, we, we heard of coconut oil, but we're now buying or importing coconut oil mm -hmm. products. And this is something naturally that we have, and we could make use of it. Mm -hmm. Sargassum is another very, it's readily available because, again, of the influx. And regional bodies, where when you go out, you see persons making plates and those um, disposable items from Sargassum. So very innovative um, solutions mm -hmm. are there in nature. You know, the, the, the theme is so timely, but 
these things have been somebody has to literally show you something physically yeah. for you to believe it can I was go. about to say for example our CMOS mm -hmm. for many years we took it for granted but now it's been packaged and persons out there saying that St. Lucian CMOS is is, among is, the yes. best. And it is being packaged. I mean, the labeling and all of that, uh, again, a lot of um, capacity building for the fishers mm -hmm. and the uh, CMOS producers, but mm -hmm. they are now packaging it and exporting it out of St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. So again, capacity building, the training, and all of those components have to come hand in hand for us to really be able to explore all of those natural options. Mm -hmm. General, what role is your department playing some of what we're speaking of, the education, capacity building, training, and what have you? Uh, these initiatives are right in line with the mandate of the Sustainable Development um, Department. We work to, in, to have persons involved in the governance of, of our natural resources. So education is, is right up there, starting from the little ones all the way up to the policy makers, having them to get an understanding, first of all, of what eco, um, ecosystems we have, what benefits are available, and so on. We, we do provide support to livelihoods development through different um, initiatives funded by the Global Environment Facility um, and our different partners, whether mm -hmm. it's UN Environment, um, UN Development Program, um, so we and we have seen some some successes. We have seen persons um, packaging shadow benny mm -hmm. or having um, uh, these different herbs available as teas and on the market and so on, but at a very small scale. So I think the dream really now is for us to see see it on a larger scale. Uh, you mentioned about Dr. St. Rose. There is a pharmacopoeia that is available um, that has a list of all of mm -hmm. the herbs and all of the plants and how they can be used. Um, and that is available online. It's available in a, in a package, a nice little disc that you can have a, a copy of. So, so some of the groundwork is there already and my department continues to provide assistance, both in terms of building capacity and also for getting access to funds. And there are other agencies that we work with like the National Conference Conservation Trust Fund um, that uh, gives those opportunities to develop livelihoods because as I mentioned before people are more likely to conserve something if there is a benefit to them and if it is a financial benefit then they can see the connection a lot easier mm -hmm. so we save this this plant not just because it's pretty and we like it um, but also because we can get some benefits mm -hmm. out of it and so that is one way they can make money for their families and they can look to to keeping a few of these trees around okay very yeah. good well, we're quickly running out of time, unfortunately. I rather suspect I'll have to have you guys back on for part two of this okay. very informative discussion. We must do it again. Mm -hmm. And the second time won't be a reunion for you guys. <laughs> I know you've been away from each other for a very long time, a while, yes. thanks to COVID-19. So just some final words from each of you. Stadius? Okay, well, I want to encourage our farmers to continue um, working diligently. Um, this is a special time for us as a nation. Um, it's a time for us to pull our forces and look at the resources that we have and to do our best as a people and to be each other's keeper. So um, for the farming sector, we at the Ministry of Agriculture are going to be there to support and we're going to provide all of the support that is needed, whether it be in trading or in any other means possible. Okay, mm -hmm. so thank you. Yeah. And I'd like to echo that a little bit and say um, to all of the farmers, I, I love you. <laughs> I'm going to be on my balcony clapping for farmers tonight <laughs> at 8 o'clock because, you know, the, the role that you provide, the service that you provide is so very important and it sets the foundation for everything else. Uh, doctors need to eat, tourists need to eat, leaders need to eat, uh, everybody needs farmers and needs food. Um, throughout this period, we will continue to celebrate Biodiversity Day as well as World Environment Day, which has the theme of sus um, sustaining biodiversity. World Oceans Day, which we celebrate on June the 8th. And um, it's also on the theme of sustainable innovations for um, a healthy ocean. And um, June the 17th is Desertification Day. So where we're looking at drought and desertification and preventing it and all of the actions that we can do. So I'm encouraging everybody to celebrate tomorrow, Biodiversity Day. Think about nature. Think about planting a tree or saving water or doing your small part. And continue to celebrate with us until the end of June. Yvonne? I just want to remind everyone out there, especially our fishers, um, that ecosystems are important, both plants and animals, they are extremely important. Um, there is value. I'm sure some of you would have gotten something out of the discussion today, but important enough is that whatever is done to nature is done to us all, and so we must protect and conserve the natural resources that we have. And there are solutions in nature. We just need to be innovative and find ways to use what we have. 
Okay, thank you. And we have Ferry in the background. Again, I think I'll have to have her back Come on back. for her own program. <laughs> but maybe on behalf of Ferry, I could say that plant a tree, protect the environment, protect the forest. And today we end the program on a sort of a somber note, but I just thought I would end today's program with a song um, from the Hero Nova Voices, of which Joyce Ogisio was part of that group. And the song is called Beautiful Isle. And of course, that song talks about the beauty mm. of St. Lucia, our natural mm. beauty. And Joyce Ogis, of course, was a St. Lucian musician and a leader of the Hero Voices. And she passed away, well, she was found dead at her home earlier on today. So mm. on behalf of all of us here at the Information Command Center, mm. we pass on, we express condolences to her family. So let's just take in that song as we end our program here today. We say thank you for joining us. Yes, yes.